Unity of Houston is an inclusive church where we seek to understand and live the teachings of Jesus and other spiritual masters. At Unity, we welcome all people from all spiritual paths and every walk of life. We celebrate the diversity of our city and of our world, and we teach love, tolerance, and oneness, seeking to live in harmony with open minds and open hearts. Wherever you are in your spiritual path, you are always welcome at Unity. Join us and discover that the life of your dreams is already within you. Eighth grade, I mean, eight-year-old Sunday school class, third graders, you know third graders, right? The teacher was trying to instill in them the joy of giving. And so the church, much like ours, had a strong presence in being of service in the community. And the teacher had an idea. He said, if you had a million dollars, would you give it to help us feed the hungry and house the homeless? And all of the eight-year-olds went, yay! Yes, I would do that. Well, what if you had $10,000? Would you give it to help? Yes, I would give it. If you had $100, yes! And finally he said, what if you had $1? Would you give it to help people? And most of the kids went, yes. But Jesse in the front row was quiet. And the teacher noticed and said, Jesse... I noticed you didn't say yes about the one dollar. And he clutched his pocket. He said, because I have one dollar. <laughs> Not so sure he was. In theory, it's good, right? In practice, generosity is a little different. I want to start with that idea. This six-week series that we are about to launch on, I don't think you're probably going to learn a lot of new stuff. But I want you to come anyway. Because I want to offer some new insights into this ancient teaching. And most of all, I want to inspire you to give your gift. And in the particular way that is right for your soul, I want you to discover the fire and the aliveness that is who you truly are. That's so much of what we teach here in this community, in our movement it's that each of us is a unique expression of God's own being, God's own light. And that if we're willing to be who we are, we can be of such benefit to those in our world and we can receive and experience the life of our dreams of great fulfillment. That is the promise. That's what we're exploring in these next six weeks. I began teaching and exploring this work, um, oh gosh, a long time ago, oh, like 17 years ago, I was in Dallas, and I'd been in this teaching for a few years, and, and I just noticed one day that in all of the places where I was working, it felt like a perfect fit. And I want to tell you, I'm not doing any of that work anymore. But it still feels that way today. It's like there's a Michael-shaped space in the place where I'm invited to come, come and give my gift. And I noticed it, and it was like, this feels great. I was singing in this really fancy piano bar where I got to meet Cheetah Rivera and Billy Joel and just an amazing experience. And it felt like I, was, I had exactly what they needed. And I just stepped into it with such ease, and I was beautifully compensated. I was serving in my community there, Center, Center for Spiritual Living in Dallas, and it was... I just had the right shaped heart and voice to give what was needed to that community and they loved and appreciated me. I thought, is this teachable? Is this transferable? Can other people have what I'm having right now from our unity teachings? This understanding that if we can let go of everything that blocks our light, we can live a life of freedom, fulfillment, purpose, and meaning. And I believe that it's possible. I don't know if there is any other topic that I have ever brought to you that I feel more passionate about, more clear about, and a greater sense of, oh, I want you to get this. But I'm going to release all attachment. Take it or leave it. As we say in the 12 steps, take what you can use and leave the rest. But if you can feel the energy that I'm bringing, it's because I know this is possible. I've been living this way for years now. And it makes a difference. Even the difficult things, you know, they're not everything in my work is as fun as some things are. I'm not going to say, I'll let you figure out which ones are not. But even the things that are challenging for my personality and my temperament and my gifts, they become easier because I get this sense that all of it is a fit for my soul. And so we're going to begin today by talking about that word, soul. 
It's very confusing what we mean by soul. There's no real clear definition of it. I think that may be just fine. Because the soul is not best understood or expressed in scientific terms and linear ideas, but maybe through poetry and through song. Did you feel Ken Gale's soul when he just sang that song? Your soul responded to something. That's what it is. So, but I went to the great resource of all things soul, Oprah Winfrey. And I was going to just go, you know, she always asked this question of her Super Soul Sunday guest, what is the soul? And someone on her team had done me a great favor in my sermon prep, but they had done a, a collage of all of the answers from these different spiritual teachers who answered the question, what is soul? And I just sort of gleaned like the, the commonalities. A lot of them said, the soul is your truest self. The soul is eternal before you were born, after you die. The soul guides us if we learn to listen to it and for it, but it never forces its will upon our choices. The soul is the very best of us. The soul carries the wisdom and the healing that we've gained in this lifetime forward after we lay down our bodies. And Ian Van Zandt, who I adore, she, I remember she was here she danced down this aisle for this conference we had and just, oh, she's just got such life and such energy. If you don't know Yanla, she's something. And that was the day of my 50th birthday. And I got to, I knew her manager. I got to go backstage there in the vestry. And anyway, it was a lot of fun. She asked me some really good questions back there. So here's what she said the soul is. The soul is the fingerprint of God that becomes a human body. Oprah kind of went, oh, say that again. The fingerprint of God that becomes a human body. I really like that. I'm going to change it a little bit. I like the idea of the fingerprint of God, but how about the fingerprint of God that now expresses and projects into body and mind? That your soul, that eternal, highest and best part of you, is a, an aspect of God's own nature, but uniquely expressed. And your soul is what has created this life for you. And in the Eastern traditions with the law of karma, what we've come to understand is even the difficulties are the soul's opportunities for us to remember who we are. The fingerprint of God projecting into a body, into a mind, into a life. This work that we're doing Oh, I did have, if, if Oprah were to ask me, maybe this is what I would say. The soul is the way that the infinite awareness gets to live itself in an exquisite individual experience. Yeah, I like the fingerprint of God better. I don't have a book that I'm going to be using for this series that we've done in our fall series in the past, but there is one book that, um, if you're in a spirit group, I'll talk about it a little bit more. But it's by Parker Palmer. It's called Let Your Life Speak. And I'm not going to, this, this series is not a study of that book, but if you're interested in this work about finding that aliveness within you, finding the voice and what I'm calling today the shape of the soul, it's a great book and it's small. He is a wonderfully gifted teacher. This is what he says. The life I am living is not the same as the life that wants to live in me. In these moments, I sometimes catch a glimpse of my true life, a life hidden like river beneath the ice. And in the spirit of the poet, I wonder, what am I meant to do? Who am I meant to be? And a little later in that same chapter, he says this, before you tell your life what you intend to do with it, listen for what it intends to do with you. Before you tell your life what values and truths you decided to live up to, let your life tell you what truths you embody, what values you represent. I'm an Enneagram 3, my friend Stephanie also an Enneagram 3. We like to achieve and accomplish, we're good at getting things done and making stuff. I love us, I think we're great. It's great to have a church with a lot of Enneagram 3s in it, I'll tell you. Here's the deal with that, as I've been studying the Enneagram, it's a uh, it's a path, it's a personality typing, but it's also a path for our healing 
that is in some ways created by a wounding. I don't know the first time that I got a gold star or I got applause for doing something or I got an A in a class, but I was addicted to that stuff right there. When I did something and I got recognized for it, I was affirmed, I felt like, ah, oh, now I know who I am. And that became my path of finding a life within me to give it into a form where I would get recognition. And it is a trap. It is a trap of the ego. And it is not who we truly are. At some point, um, and so many teachers talk about this, Richard Rohr has a beautiful book um, called Falling Upward where he speaks about the first half of life and the second half of life, borrowing it, and a theme or an idea from Carl Jung. That the first half of life, we build the container of who we are, of how we live. And that's how I use my Enneagram 3 for the first half, and it's not a chronological half. But then at some point, it becomes the thing you have to break through. And the second half of life is, how will I inhabit this container? And at some point, I knew that I could not live by the recognition of my accomplishments. That was not enough for my soul. That I needed some, something that was deeper and more meaningful for me. You see, the ego loves that recognition, loves to feel important. Do you know why? Because it's afraid that it's not. And so many of us, no matter what your Enneagram type, what, I'm going to be talking about soul and ego today in just a few minutes. And I want, I want you to know that there are many definitions for these terms, but I'm using them in a specific way today. Soul as being that fingerprint of God, seeking to live. It's what Parker, Parker Palmer said. It's like the, the, the river that's flowing beneath the ice. We can't quite see it, but there is a life in me that wants to use me for something if I'm willing to get out of the way. The ego doesn't care about anything beneath the surface. The ego lives at the surface and lives for all of the surface stuff. But how many of you have come to the place where you realize it does not satisfy the soul? And something deeper is asking for our attention. Soul. I turn to Ram Dass, and I believe we have a couple of slides here. Laddie, if you can bring up the first one. This is a diagram from uh, Ram Dass, the wonderful spiritual teacher. He calls this the three levels of consciousness, ego, soul, and awareness. And this is the way that most people live. The ego is what is on the outside. The ego is what is experiencing the world. It's the ego that is, um, and here's what he says about that. I thought this was really good. The ego realm includes all things that we experience as ourselves on the psychophysical plane. Our physical bodies, our personalities, fame, reputation, possessions, emotions, and the conceptual structures within our minds that develop to help us function there. It's exactly what I was talking about with my life. The ego, to borrow Descartes' famous saying, is made of who we think we are. A body-mind of a certain age with certain tastes, desires, and opinions. Peering out at the world, the ego sees only other egos, separate sensory beings, and takes as its operating system what science is able to explain, where the brain computer is its sole conveyor. But ego thing is a, ego is a tiny thing in the sea of awareness. Can you show the next slide now? This is the way that we are built to live. And what I mean by awareness is the one mind, one life, universal presence and intelligence, God, spirit, the universe. This is what we are. This is the truth. We are expressions of this infinite. And if you can imagine that you have these two circles, but awareness is a circle that extends to infinity beyond and we are invited to live there. And the ego is still with us, necessary for helping us to metabolize experience here on earth, helpful for us to know that I'm me and I'm not Marilyn. It's helpful for that so that I, I, we need the ego, but it needs to be in its place. And in this model, you can see that it is a smaller piece floating in the sea of awareness, as Ram Dass says. 
And I haven't mentioned the middle one on both of these slides, which is soul. Ram Dass speaks of the, the invitation to move from ego awareness to soul awareness. You see, the, the awareness awareness, pure being, pure consciousness, it's kind of hard to do that while we have bodies. It's, there's nothing you can say about that. It is unnameable, unknowable, unexpressible. The soul is that middle way. The soul is the thing that we can reach into the infinite, inexhaustible, creative good of God and bring it into human experience, into life on earth. The soul is the path for how the infinite good gets to find out what it's like to be Christina, having a lifetime, what it's like to be David. And you and I are at the portals of choice. Do we live a life of separation and ego, or do we live a life of the soul, the deepest part of us that wants to express and experience life and uniquely as is right for you and for me. That's the beauty of this. It's not like we all just kind of get this generic God expression and that we're all going to do it exactly the same, exactly the opposite. The more we dive into this work, the more individualized we actually become. Actually, that's not true. We are already, if in all of time and space, we are, we are all unique but we discover more of that uniqueness. We're able to give more of that uniqueness. We live more of the right way for us. And so every time you feel yourself frustrated, stymied by life, in pain, whenever you feel yourself in patterns that don't help you grow or live or love, it's all an invitation to let it go, to find a deeper meaning of who you are and give it. As I mentioned, 20 years ago, I found, it was really 20 years ago, I discovered this was happening in my life. I found such joy in my relationships and in my work. And guess what? Like I said, I'm not doing any of that anymore. My soul has continued to grow. The soul doesn't grow. My awareness and ability to let the soul shine through has grown. I wish I'd put this quote in there. It just occurred to me from A Course in Miracles. I'll probably get it wrong. My course students will correct me later. When Jesus says, I don't have anything you don't have, the difference is I don't have anything else. Do you get it? All of us carry, each of us carries conditioning from our parents who were doing the best they could with what they were given by their parents, by our culture, which our culture has some really funny ideas. Have you noticed? We carry generations of pain and trauma, and that's just from our biological ancestors. I'm not even going to get into the whole karma and past lives thing. We carry a lot, and the invitation is to, as much as we're able, to discern that which is not authentic to the soul and let it go. And then we shine. We shine. And we begin to live from soul awareness. Here's a simple test to determine whether or not you're coming from soul or ego. The ego does not love. It can't. Holmes defines loving, uh, love as the self-givingness of spirit. The ego doesn't give. The soul doesn't fight. And if you find yourself fighting, as so many of us do these days, with the news, with family, that's not from the soul. There is a, a German word Sonder. Do you know this word? It's really lovely. Do you know what? Germans have words for everything, and they're usually really long because they just keep adding words together to make a new word. I love it. But this word, it simply means this, the realization that each random passerby is living a life as vivid and as complex as your own. This is from the poet Rilke. 
The more human we become, the more different we become. It's as if suddenly human beings would multiply a thousandfold. A collective name that used to be sufficient for thousands will soon be too narrow for ten human beings. And we will be forced to consider each individual entirely on his or her own. Just think, when at some point we have a, a human beings instead of populations... Just think, when at some point we will have human beings instead of populations, nations, families, and societies, when it will no longer be possible to group even three people under the same name, will the world not have grown larger then? What Rilke is pointing us to is this beautiful fact of incarnate reality. That if we know who we are and we stop living by our family's expectations and society's norms and cultures, if we really get in in contact with the soul uniqueness, because the ego has some uniqueness too, and I'm going to get into that right now, about what it wants, we begin to see each other differently. We begin to experience other people not as that Democratic or that Republican Party, but as individuals who are equally unique expressions of God, a soul that wants to shine. Do you feel me? I've been having this revelation around when Jesus said, don't judge or you will be judged. In the same measure you judge others, it will be measured back to you. That that Scripture has meant a lot to me over the years, and I've worked so diligently on releasing my judgment and my criticism, my otherizing. I spoke about that a couple of weeks ago. But the revelation that's been coming lately is it's kind of the counter of the truth that Jesus was speaking of. That if we stop judging ourselves, if we start accepting ourselves, stop fighting ourselves, because here's the other part of this message. You are a brilliant expression of God, but you're never going to be perfect while you're breathing air. You're never going to heal all of that family stuff. You're never going to be without, you're going to have bad days. I just, this is probably not the message you expected in unity, but it's true. Affirm all you want, you're going to have tough days. But if you can just stop fighting, stop punishing yourself for being human. That when we do that, when we start loving and accepting ourselves, guess what? We automatically start loving and accepting others. It happens automatically because we have dropped into soul. I've been sharing. I wasn't talking about this either. I got, we got to go. Oh, but I'm on something, so just give me a minute. I've been sharing about um, grieving my, my youth, which, you know, a lot of people are like, you're a little late to the party, Michael. <laughs> you're 55. <laughs> but there's something happening with that and um, accepting. And I, the affirmation that landed for me, which I use all the time now, is I love, my job is to love this body as it ages. And I was at the gym this week, and I'm doing bicep curls. And, and you know, 20 years ago, my body would just get back right into shape really quick. It doesn't do that at this age. (laughs) And I looked over in the mirror, because they have a lot of mirrors in the gyms, and there are all these, you know, 30-year-old perfect body people out there and who like the mirrors. And and I saw this aging version of myself looking back at me. And I saw the, the puffy eyes and the sagging skin and the pudge in the middle. And I... And I looked at him and I just said, I love you. I love you. And I saw it. I felt it. It was a healing moment right there at 24 Hour Fitness. (laughs) And I'm telling you, this is possible for us every day. Healing, releasing centuries of family trauma, we can do it every day if we can get out of the way and shine as we are intended to. Gary, would you go ahead and start playing? This is a...
I swear this has become holy scripture for us in unity, even though it was written by Marianne Williamson, who grew up here in Houston, here in the, she wrote it in the 80s. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? Isn't that brave? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people don't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children shine. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. And it's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. This is what we're about for the next six weeks is to liberate ourselves from the fear of our light. Would you join me in prayer? There is only one life, one light, one love, one power, one peace, one joy, one infinitely good life that is the life of spirit. There is nothing else. And this life must express in infinite forms and in each of us the fingerprint of that infinite life and intelligence. Each of us an individuated facet on the eternal diamond of God. Each of us here to shine in a particularly beautiful, unrepeatable, irreplaceable way. And so what I know right now is that each of us is willing. I speak my word of willingness over this church, over this community, over all who hear this message, that we are willing to drop from the ego down into the soul, down into the authentic place within us that knows, that knows who we are. And from that place we love, from that place we laugh and play, from that place we sing and dance, and from that place, we give voice to the infinite one. So as we take up this journey, what I know and accept is that we are all changed. And as we change individually, we change as a spiritual community and as families, and we change the world, shining a little brighter in our corner. I'm so grateful for this truth. I'm so grateful for this teaching. I'm so grateful for this community. Thank you, God. I don't know who told you the lies. I don't know who said that you are not the light of the world, but I'm here to remind you that you are. And if no one has told you today that they love you, I love you. God bless you. Thank you for watching this message today. I'd like to invite you to join us in person here on campus at Unity of Houston for Sunday morning or Wednesday evening services. If you can't be with us here on our campus, you can still join us live on Facebook or on our website, unityhouston.org, Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. Central.